학문내 법의 학술 위원장으로 있고요. 이번 대회 공동조직 위원장을 맡고 있는 서울시립대학교의 강로환이라고 합니다. 반갑습니다. 지금 첫 번째 전세 세션이 되는데요. 키노트 스피커 두 분을 모시고 발표를 듣겠습니다. 첫 번째 발표해 주실 선생님은 기본소득 이론가로서 가장 명성이 있으신 분인데요. 리얼 프리덤 포 5월이라는 책의 저자시고요. 95년도에 그 책자가 나왔는데 한국에서 지금 약 20년, 21년 만이네요. 21년 만에 번역돼서 책이 출간돼서 나왔습니다. 그리고 두 번째 발표를 맡아주실 선생님은 핀란드의 얀 오토 안데르손 선생님이십니다. 두분다 원로신데 얀 오토 안데르손 선생님께서는 핀란드 기본소득 운동의 이제 시발점이 된 이론가셨습니다. 지금 은퇴하셔가지고 계속 연구를 진행 중이신데요. 우선 두 분을 이렇게 간단히 소개 드리고 그리고 마이크를 필리팜 파이스 선생님에게 넘겨서 자기소개 조금 해주시면서 발표를 시작해 주시기 바랍니다. So from uh, all you know and uh, also from what has been said uh, today, it's clear that this year 2016 will be remembered forever in the history of the basic income movement. There has been a more intense debate, a far more wider, a far wider knowledge uh, about uh, basic income in this year so far. Than there has been not only in the 30 years of Bian's existence, but in the whole history of mankind. And this is due to a number of different things. And the most spectacular one was no doubt the Swiss referendum. Huh? The most, in the most conservative country of the world that we have just heard, <laughs> having uh, such a, a massive mobilization was very impressive and had an impact far beyond uh, Switzerland. But of course it was not the only one, several other things have been mentioned, not least what we are doing today, which is the first Congress, Young Congress, to be held in the most populated continent of the world. I was hoping that uh, I could contribute uh, to uh, this 2016 year by publishing a book for which I've been making notes for about 30 uh, years, with, and, uh, namely the book that uh, to be published by uh, Harvard University Press that is meant to be a big book of synthesis on all aspects of basic income. But unfortunately, because of people like you doing all sorts of things on basic income around the world, we've been prevented from working on this book as much as we would have liked, and so it will be published in the spring of 2017 and not this year. So it was a fantastic uh, uh, surprise but uh, and also far more than a consolation to discover that uh, the Korean translation of my uh, book on the philosophical defense on basic income had been published in time for this conference so many thanks for all that so, uh, and is the translator in the room because I, I always have a, an immense debt for all the translators especially for this sort of very uh, austere book, uh, and so I would like, if I have a chance, to thank that person uh, personally. But then, all these things that uh, have been mentioned also by the other speakers, but all, each of them there is something contingent. Each of them is due to the uh, effort, to the perseverance, to the enthusiasm of a handful of people, including the Congress today. But all of them are nevertheless the symptom of something deeper, a deeper trend that explains why today the soil is riper, is better prepared for the idea, why the audience is more receptive worldwide to this idea. What might this be? This will be my central question. And then, at the end, I turn to uh, more controversial issue, which I want to raise, and I think it's the right place to raise. Why might it be that the audience 
<coughs> is more receptive? I think the answer is different in developed and less developed countries. And given that the time is limited, I'll concentrate on uh, developed countries. Why is it that there is more interest for basic income, wider interest than there has ever been in the history of these societies? I think for two fundamental reasons. The first reason, and I'll develop briefly each of them, or briefly the second one and the first, uh, the first reason is that we've realized that we need to find a structural solution for unemployment which doesn't rely on sustained growth. And the second reason, Guy has alluded to that, is that we badly need today, more than at many times in the past, a positive mobilizing utopia. Come to that afterwards. First, first item, um, first reason for this more fertile soil, uh, the need to find a solution for unemployment that doesn't rely on growth. We've uh, heard, it has been alluded to also by earlier speakers, we hear all these forecasts about robotization, further automation, the loss of jobs because of uh, labor-saving technology. But there is nothing new about that. In the 1920s, when there was the first debate on basic income, there were arguments of that type being used. In the 1960s, when the debate came up in the late 60s in the United States, there, was, there were all these forecasts about automation. But so far, the consensus reply to, that, uh, to that, those forecasts and to the people who were saying uh, there is there's going to be big structural unemployment, the standard consensual reply was, no, we'll have growth. It's true there is labor-saving technology. It's true some people will lose their jobs. It's true it will be possible to produce more things per unit of time, but we'll simply produce more. We'll produce more things. And growth will absorb these unemployment, will make production grow faster than productivity in order to absorb the existing stock of unemployment. And this worked. To some extent, it did. But not quite. And why today, why today, why what's new today, what's new today is there's more skepticism than there has ever been about the desirability of growth, about the possibility of sustained growth, and about the effectiveness of growth uh, as far as solving this problem is concerned. Desirability, yes. In the 1970s, we knew already about the ecological limits to growth, about the need for an ecological transformation. But since then, we've discovered laboriously, painfully, the inconvenient truth of climate change. So there is more skepticism than ever about the desirability of growth, all things considered, including all its side effects on the environment. But even growth itself, the desirability of growth itself, irrespective of these side effects, has been challenged. There's something called the Easterlin paradox, which has been uh, investigated and confirmed in various forms, which says, well, when you look historically for the wealthy countries, you see that the real income per capita has kept growing, but the degree of satisfaction of people with their lives has not grown at all. Hmm? The second sort of skepticism. Thirdly, even people who regard growth as desirable, Larry Summers, for example, the former president of Harvard, and a celebrated economist, uh, keeps speaking about secular stagnation. Hmm? People who regard growth as desirable say, yes, but it won't be possible, we won't have sustained growth. Last and not least, uh, has growth, is growth really the solution? Since the beginning of the golden 60s, so-called golden 60s, we've had growth again and again in our countries. Well, depending on the country, between two and three times richer than we were at the beginning of the 1960s. Do we have less precariousness? Do we have less unemployment than we had then? No. So it's for this reason, and this combination of continued 
technological uh, progress, if you call that progress, so labor saving technology with skepticism about growth makes for the fertile soil for something different. Is there something different? Yes, you all know in this room that there is. One way of explaining why it is an answer to this problem is something, a nice formulation, which goes back to even before Bien was created, which was phrased by a Dutch professor of social medicine at the Free University of Amsterdam, Jan Peter Kuyper, who said, it's crazy. I have two categories of patients who come to see me. There are people who are sick because they work too much, and there are people who are sick because they can't find a job. Yes. And so that's what led him to the idea of a basic income. Give a basic income, make it possible for people who work too much to reduce their working time, and at the same time, make it possible for other people to get a job, be it a part-time job, in part because of the positions that will have been vacated by the people who reduce their working time, and in part because a basic income is universal. It's uh, it's a floor on which you can stand, not a net into which you can, in which you can get, get stuck. And so, def, and for that reason, you can combine uh, basic income, this unconditional income, universal income, with income from other sources, which makes it possible for far more people to get access to work. And so, this idea of basic income is centrally relevant, not only in order to make the uh, fight against poverty more effective, but in order to address this central problem for any capitalist society, which is to address the problem of unemployment today without relying on sustained, continuous, accelerated growth. So that's, according to me, the first reason why there is now and why there will be ever more a very widespread interest in the most diverse circles, employers and trade unions, uh, the right and the left, uh, increased, there will be increased interest for basic income. But there is a second reason. And the second reason is what I announced before, the need for a mobilizing utopia. I was struck not long ago in Italy by uh, what was said by a specialist of jihadism, who said that uh, there were lots of people, also of French origin, not only of uh, uh, Moroccan origin or uh, origin of an Islamic country, who were attracted by this absurd utopia of a worldwide Islamic caliphate. They were attracted by it because they needed a mobilizing utopia, something that would give a, a, a meaning to their collective action. What we need today, more than many times in uh, many periods in, in the past is really something that we can look forward to, a sort of coherent vision of uh, a future that can give us hope. Hope is the most important productive force of any society and even of, uh, of any economy. And we need an alternative to neoliberalism but also to Soviet type socialism, to uh, uh, populist uh, uh, nationalism, and uh, even to the Islamic states in some places where it may be tempting, and basic income is part of that. It's only part of that. We need a whole set of utopians. We, in uh, my university, the University of Louvain, celebrated this year the publication 500 years ago in Louvain of Thomas More's Utopia. And we took advantage of this opportunity to have a whole year on utopias for our times. We had a, uh, we have each year then a celebration where we honor three people as representatives of the sort of utopias we need. Uh, one of them was uh, Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia. Another one was an Italian architect. And the third one was a, sort of a, a, one of the greatest, most perseverant uh, advocates of uh, basic income, namely Senator Eduardo Suplicy here present, who got it, this was probably another premiere uh, this year in 2016 where an honorary degree was given to someone because of his struggle uh, for years, for decennia, in favor of, uh, uh, of the idea of a basic income. So it's a central part of it. And we, had we had more time, 
If we had more time, I would have, uh, or if you can spare three minutes one day, just try to Google uh, Louvain, Suplicy, Utopie, and you'll have a fantastic piece of music and of, uh, of uh, singing, where not entirely by Eduardo, but partly by Eduardo, watch it to the end, and watch also the slight uneasiness, worry, uh, in the eyes and amusement in the eyes of our rector sitting next to him. But uh, and if you try, try to see, it's worth it's worth three minutes, especially the end of it. Okay. So that's the the second reason. So I repeat, uh, all these things that have been fantastic opportunities for spreading the idea of basic income, the arguments for basic income. Each of them is due to, to the effort, to the enthusiasm of a number of individuals, but all of them are the reflection of a more fertile soil, which in my view is due in the more developed countries to these two factors. We urgently need a plausible, credible answer to the question of unemployment, despite the fact that we can't rely on continued growth, one, in, in developed countries, and two, second reason, is that we need a coherent, an attractive, a smart utopia that can mobilize it. Not only basic income, combination with a number of things, but basic income is a central part of it. Okay. But it's not enough, and that's my, my uh, the other issue on which, uh, with which uh, then I'll, uh, I'll end, on which I'll end. We not only need this utopia, we don't want a dream that may end up in a nightmare. We have this sort of shining star that indicates a direction, but we also need to make sure that we don't trip along the way. Hence the importance, certainly hence the interest in experiments. Huh? You don't just say, look, it's marvelous, we are going to have this uh, wonderful society. So there are people who say, yes, but are you sure? Huh? So can you show that uh, we are not going to fall along the way, that it won't lead to a disaster? Hence, the interest in experiments, mentioned already before, uh, that are uh, uh, sort of uh, being uh, tried, planned in a number of countries. But I would like, and that's the more controversial thing I want to say, I would, I would like to warn, to warn against these experiments. Speaking again about the experiments that are relevant to uh, basic income, the introduction of a basic income in developed uh, countries. One against them for two reasons. One, the difficulty of conducting a proper experiment, an experiment that is methodologically sound, but above all, above all, because of the danger that it uh, that lies in the framing, in the interpretation of the results of the experiments. As regards this latter point, I always remember, and I want you to remember that too, the conversation I had with James Tobin in uh, 1998, just the day before his 80th birthday, and when I was a, a visiting professor at Yale, where he's been teaching uh, much of his academic year. And we had a long discussion on basic income. Jim Tobin, was the person who, in the late 60s, early 70s, convinced the presidential candidate, George McGovern, to put basic income, the name Demogrant, in his electoral platform. Jim Tobin is also one of those who inspired the massive negative income tax experiments uh, that started in the late 60s and continued in the 1970s. And he said, he said, look, there were two main results from these experiments. Neither of these two results surprised me. But what did surprise me and deeply disappointed me was the political reaction to these two results. What were these two results as summarized by uh, Tobin? One is that in all the experiments, there were a number of them, in all these experiments uh, we could see a fall uh, not enormous, but statistically clearly significant and causal, because the, methodologically the, the experiment was well done. Uh, it was a clear decline in the labor supply of secondary earners, mostly mothers. That's one. And two, there was an increase in one of the experiments, there was an increase in the divorce rate, okay? the rate of divorce. Okay. 
uh, Tobin said neither of these two things surprised me because in fact they were related to the fact that women got greater, uh, wider choice and could therefore choose something that was better for their lives. Instead of having a double shift, getting up early in the morning, rushing to work, uh, putting their kids somewhere, rushing to work, coming back uh, uh, after a long commute, etc. in the evening, they could have, if only for a number of years, a more relaxed life because they could work part time or they could interrupt their working time. Okay, that's one. And two, the rate of divorce. It's the number of women who were uh, financially completely dependent on a partner that couldn't bear. Finally, that could say, uh, Fort, uh, uh, I'm leaving. And, um, and that showed in this uh, small increase, but significant increase in the rate of divorce. And so what is important is that we should, in advance also, say what we should expect from these experiments. And that is, and here, and so I want you to, do, to listen carefully because this will be very important. If the Finnish experiment goes through, and we'll hear more about that, uh, if the Dutch, if something like similar experiments uh, take root in, in Holland, there are some more vague plans in, in Canada, uh, even in France there are some, plan, uh, some, some plans. But we need to be very, very careful. Why? And essentially because we shall be unable to learn much, we'll be able to learn only very little about what would be the impact of the real introduction of a basic income in our countries. Why? Three reasons. First, e every one of these experiments, planned or done before, are for a limited time. Hmm? One year, two years, five years, whatever. And so you are unable to infer from what you see in these experiments to what people would do if they knew that they were going to get their basic income for the whole of their life. Will they if they get it for two years, will they say, okay, I'll take this opportunity and do something else for these two years? Or on the contrary, will they say, I certainly won't need my job because this is for only two years? No way to know that. That's one thing. First limitation. Second limitation. A basic income is above all a way of transforming the labor market. It is in the first place a way of transforming the labor market by making it possible for people to say yes to some jobs which are not viable now because they are highly attractive jobs in themselves, they provide training, they are nice, nice to do, they are meaningful, they correspond to people's calling, but they pay little or they pay in a very uncertain way. These jobs should develop. That's a central argument for basic income. And other jobs which are unattractive, unattractive, we don't teach you, which don't teach you anything, which uh, are done under a, a disagreeable boss and so on, those jobs won't find anyone to fill them because you can say no to a job and therefore they will need to be paid more. But these two effects, making some jobs that are good in themselves more viable and that give more cap human capital to be more viable, and the other effect which is a rise in the quality or in the pay of the jobs that are not good in themselves now, neither of these jobs will be observable in the experiments because even in like in the Finnish case, which is, would be the, the best one where you have uh, as a several thousands of people, random sample of several thousands of people that are subjected or that are in the new, that are the subjects of, uh, of this experiment. If there, these are a few thousand people in the labor market of several million, and you won't be able to see these effects on the labor market. So that, uh, that's the second reason. And the third reason, just as important and intrinsic to them, is that whatever the experiment, you'll never be able to put in the sample the people who will be net contributors to the scheme. And you can, in other negative income tax experiments, you could have uh, a number of people, you never had the whole of the population uh, involved, or, uh, even in Dauphin, in, in Canada, it was not the whole of, of the population, it was one third of the population, and you could only include people who will be better off for this period as a result of receiving the basic income. But there is a net cost. If you give a higher income to some people at the very bottom or to the part-time workers, someone will need to be, uh, to, to be taxed more than would otherwise be the case, certainly in the immediate way. Those cannot be forced to be in the sample 
they won't, if they are not forced, they won't come voluntarily in this sample. And therefore, and for this reason, from any experiment you can expect the following. Suppose there is some fall in the labor supply. Some people will say already, well, like they did in America, this shows that it's a bad scheme because there is a fall. Some people, some people work less than before. Of course. Uh, moreover, they'll be able to say legitimately, you didn't take into account the fact that they'll receive this for life rather than just for two years. Right? And you didn't take any account of the fact that some people will be taxed more and may work less as a result of, tax, of being taxed more. None of this is in the experiment. So people who are against basic income can seize any experiment by saying, well, uh, some people work less, and this is an underestimating the extent to which people work, will work less, so it's even worse a basic income than what it shows. You can expect that before the experiment starts. Moreover, the positive, aspect, the, the positive impact of basic income, the fact that new jobs of a new kind will be created, and that was my second point, and the fact that some jobs will keep attracting people, but only because they pay more, huh? these effects will not be visible in the test. Huh? So, a slightly, slightly technical thing about it, but there are really these three intrinsic limits, even in the best experiments. So, what should we do? And I'll finish with this. Uh, should we then take a big jump, a big adventure, and say, let's go for $2,500 as proposed individually, uh, universally, unconditionally, as it was proposed in, in the Swiss uh, experiments? No. Uh, what should we do if, if we can't have experiments? Uh, well, we should do what was done with the previous two model of so models of social protection. The two models that make up our current welfare states. Social assistance was started at the beginning of the 16th century in some small, well not so small for the time, Flemish and German cities. Social insurance was started at the end of the 19th century uh, by Bismarck in Germany. What did I do before in, when they introduced that? Did Bismarck organize a randomized experiment in order to find out whether old age pensioners would save less if they got a state pension than otherwise? No. What they did, beginning of the 16th century or in the 19th century with these two very different models, social assistance, social insurance, is that started small. Huh? Bismarck's pension was a uh, large category of the workers was 19% of their uh, latest wage. It was very, very low compared to the pension systems we have in our cities, hmm? compared perhaps even to the pension system introduced first in, in Mexico, in the case of uh, Mexico City. Huh? They started small, and then, uh, but with measures that already made a difference for some people's lives, and then they gained confidence from these schemes and it grew and it grew and, and then because it worked, it was copied elsewhere, etc. So I think that's the way we need to move forward. That is, we introduce something that's a modest basic income that's not sufficient uh, to live on if you live on your own in Zurich, but that still makes a lot of difference because it's strictly unconditional. So the rate of take-up will be higher because it widens the set uh, of options to, to people, even if it's at a low level. You don't need to have a level high enough for you to, uh, to wish to, li to, to lie in a hammock for the rest of your life. No. It can be at a, at a low level, make a difference, and that's the way forward. And, and the, the way of getting there will be highly, will vary greatly from country to country, depending on the political situation, but depending also on the structure of the tax and of uh, the, the social uh, security system as it exists. So this is the message I wanted to, to get to you and, and at the same time emphasizing in the 30 years that we've known the emphasize the extreme importance of the sort of meetings we are having today where we can share experiences in various countries. No country will follow the same path as others but it's so important to get reliable information 
an intelligent analysis about what's going on, being done, what is being tried, etc., in the various countries, in order to move forward. As was repeated again and again, in particular in the Swiss case, we are very far from the end of the story. There's, uh, there's much to be done, and we need to keep fighting for something that is really a, a, a better world than the world we have, a world in which there is less inequality, in which power, above all, is distributed in a much wider fashion. That's why we are here today. This is what I, and I'm sure many others in this room, will keep struggling for up to our last breath. Thank you. Dear friends, I appreciate the opportunity to speak at this Bien conference. Thirty years ago, I was an enthusiastic participant in Laurent Laneuve at the founding conference of our organization. I took home with me a piece by Philippe van Parijs and Robert van der Veen. It had the enticing title, The Capitalist Road to Communism. And I used it to make basic income a central pillar in the reorganization of the Finnish left political party. I am very glad to be able to meet again here at the conference the warm-hearted Korean basic income activists who visited my home three years ago. This is a picture from there, close to the place where this picture was taken. There once lived a pioneer in the study of the Finno-Ugrian and several Asian languages, Gustav Ramstedt. He was especially interested in the etymological history of Korean and he found some interesting links between Finnish and Korean. His findings still today contribute to a feeling of connectedness between Koreans and Finns. <laughs> Let me start by telling you why I think basic income is on the political agenda almost all over the world. And why this trend is growing. In poor countries, the most direct and promising way to eliminate poverty and vulnerability is to adopt a basic income. It need not be very costly fiscally, <coughs> since quite a low unconditional benefit would make a big difference in the lives of the destitute. When you live on one dollar a day, one dollar more is important for you, although cheap for the taxpayer. We can uh, hear more about this in the pilot study on India uh, later on. In rich countries, there already are various ways to restrain uh, uh, abject poverty, but economic globalization and digitalization have undermined economic security for a growing part of the population, the precariat. Young adults who are unable to find decent jobs constitute the bulk of the income poor. The combination of growing inequalities and deflationary disruptions calls for novel macroeconomic policies that redistribute income. I believe that basic income is a necessary condition for the delinking from the imperative of incessant economic growth, just as Van Parijs recently said here. And that in the rich part of the world, basic income is the most direct and promising way to deal with many of the socio-economic problems encountered today.
We can distinguish between three different welfare state regimes in the European rich countries. The corporatist regimes in the European continent, the liberal regimes in the English-speaking world, and the social democratic regimes in the Nordic countries. Uh, well, I will not take that much time about it. In the Anglo-speaking countries, there has been a lot of discussions for a long time on basic income. The Nordic model is a kind of combination of the corporatist continental welfare regime and the Anglo-Saxon uh, more universal uh, regime related to residence. Say that the regimes are Nordic regimes. Well, I had some map here somewhere between, but that's, that is something missing in the in the story. I wanted to show show you more exactly what it was about. There are five countries: Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden, and Iceland, which belong to the the Nordic regimes, and sometimes the Netherlands are included in this when it comes to the type of welfare regime. You have on the one hand mandatory social insurance systems related to employment, but you also have almost free public services for all as well as universal social benefits, such as the child benefits, study grants, parental allowances, basic unemployment and sickness benefits, and guaranteed minimum pensions called people's pensions. There is also in the Nordic countries a means-tested income guarantee that ensures a minimum standard of life for all residents. So in a sense, there is a, a kind of basic income, but it is very complex and it's not completely unconditional. The Nordic models are characterized by certain traits, such as strong labor market organizations that cover both the employers and the employed. The national collective agreements comprise wages as well as other labor conditions, including the income related to unemployment insurance. The agreements also bind the firms and workers that are not organized. The labor market organizations are also influential actors in the mandatory occupational pension systems. Secondly, a high participation of women in the labor market. Public childcare is regarded as a right and fathers are encouraged to use part of the parental leave. Thirdly, high taxes on both income and consumption. Most social transfers are included in the taxable income and there are few tax deductions. Therefore, the proportion of taxes in the national income is high about 50%. Half of the public expenses cover public consumption and social services. The other half income transfers, primarily to households. Fourthly, political support for the national welfare regimes is strong in the population and in political parties. However, in order to retain the high level of tax income, 
high participation in the labor force is seen as a necessary condition. The Nordics have a long tradition of active labor market policies, an early form of workfare. And I would say that what is called a Lutheran work ethic is still strong. It implies that you work not only in order to gain an income, but also to contribute to society at large. You could say that basic income reached the Nordic models from Denmark with the book Revolt from the Center in 1978. And uh, then it was speaking, uh, spoken about a borgerlen or a citizen's wage that could be granted to all inhabitants. And this term is still used, but basic income is used by the proponents nowadays mostly. But Ordinary people speak about citizens' wage. There was a struggle in Denmark in the 80s and 90s, which was for a basic income. But it was, in a sense, lost, and what you got in Denmark is this flex security model, where you try to promote employment security over job security. And to some extent, they have achieved this. Finland has been put on the basic income world map because of one short sentence, just two words. No, no it's not on this scale. Just two words. I, I read them in Finnish first. Toteutetaan perustulo kokeilu. This means an experiment with basic income will be implemented. <laughs> it was the new prime minister from the center party, Juho Sipilä, who insisted on this inclusion. The center party that originally was an agrarian party and its role in the establish had a role in the establishment of the Finnish social model with universal benefits, such as the people's pension and child benefits. And the youth organization for this party has for a long time been advocating a basic income. Two other parties have also worked for basic income That's the Green Party since, had they, uh, have, since they were founded in 1987, they have a basic income on their uh, program. And uh, the Left Alliance 1990 accepted uh, what is called, was called a citizen's income as a, as a focal political aim. Both parties have nowadays rather detailed basic income proposals, including schemes for financing and saying how the reform would affect taxes as well as other social benefits. The distributional effects of the proposals have been calculated with the use of micro-simulation models. Although both parties have participated in earlier governments, they have not been able to bring it, to, to bring, bring it on the agenda as they would like to, and that because the Social Democratic Party has for a long time been uh, critical towards the basic income. And, and you know that we call this the Social Democratic Welfare Regimes, and they are very proud of what they have achieved. And they also are are concerned, th think that you still can get full employment for everyone or something like that. And that's why they are, for, together with some of the trade unions, have been criticizing basic income. Uh, now, the interesting thing with the situation when we have now this experiment coming 
is that the youth of the social democrats have put forward a model where <coughs> there is a three-layer system. You have a guaranteed income is a, at the lowest level, giving about 80% of what is necessary to live on. And this is in the form of a negative income tax. Then you have a universal income for those who are seeking a job or trying to get a job uh, 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 or are working actually. And then you have a third part, the participation income part, which is 120% of what is needed to live on. And that participation means you are participating in something which is socially important. And I think that if the social democrats could come, maybe they must because they don't have a vision to do to take on a basic income and in that case it would be possible to make it work in Finland as a whole. But without the social democrats and the trade unions, uh, even if we have a good experiment, it would not come true. But uh, you can say even in the trade unions there are forces now trying to include the precariat trying to do something for them, and not only for those who are already employed. I must, however, make some disappointing remarks about the Finnish pilot study. The work done by the research team that explored ways to carry out the experimental study has been the best possible under the restrictions set by the government. However, now the ball is back in the government court and the responsible minister is uh, an inexperienced member of the True Finn party who knows little about basic income, little about social experiments and little about juridical pitfalls. So the writing of the law for the pilot test has not proceeded as it should. And it's almost certain that the experiment cannot start on January 1st, 2017, as originally planned. But it will probably start in the 1st of January, 2018. It will be a randomized pilot. So, uh, randomly among the, all citizens in Finland or, and probably also in one local place randomly you will take uh, a, a, a population and they are forced to participate in this. You cannot say I, I don't like to be in And that, that's a, a kind of legal problem we have because according to the constitution, constitution Everybody should be treated equally, and, and, but uh, I, I, they, are, they are working on this and trying to, to find a way that makes it so that if you are picked out, you have to participate. Uh, however, there will be only a part of the populations that will be uh, in this sample, so, and, and it's not yet clear, will it be long-term unemployed? Will it be people with an income, low income, and so on? And one group which probably not will be included is the young ones, those under 25, because they would, with this system, would really get much more money than they get today with, with for instance, study grants. And uh, so it would be costly, and, and, but we hope to have another experiment which is just directed toward the young. What will they do if they receive a basic income? And maybe this could then be lower than the one which is suggested. About 700 or 800 euros is 
what is suggested to be. And then you calculate what tax rates you would have. have. That is the idea of our pilot study. I shall end my presentations on a more cheery note. In, in the Nordic countries, in Iceland, they are not only good at football. Uh, there was a massive political unrest related to the Panama Papers scandal. And there is a party called the Pirate Party. And uh, in the, uh, the, the uh, in, in the polls, they got 43% support from the island, uh, island, island, island population, Iceland population. 43%. And they are staunch supporters of a basic income. That was something just exploding. Well, thank you for your attention and your friendship. I hope to be among those welcoming some of you to the 2018 Bian Congress, which we have proposed to arrange in Finland. Thank you.